Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is Scott Reich of Crime Talk. And today on the docket, we have several matters to talk about. First, Shanann Watts' family comes to the Watts house in Frederick, Colorado, and makes a plea for decency. Second, is there a time to kill? The federal government announced that they were going to resume executions. Let's meet the first five people the United States government wants to execute. Next on the docket, no surprise here on the phrasing matter. And finally on the docket, we have an Arizona teacher who's pled guilty to having sex with her students and she blames the student. Let's talk about it. Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is Scott Reich of Crime Talk. Thank you for tuning in to our channel. We appreciate all that you do, and this channel would not be possible without you, so thank you very much. If you like the channel, please subscribe. If you like the video, please hit that like button and leave a comment below on anything you'd like to talk about. First thing on the docket is Shanann Watts' family came back to Frederick, Colorado with their attorneys by their sides and basically asked that there be decency, um, particularly on social media as it related to her, related to their family, specifically the discussion as it relates to uh, Shanann Watts. Uh, Frankie Ruzik, Shanann Watts' father, made a plea for decency. They are astounded by the conspiracy theories that are going out there and the disrespect that they believe it's causing to uh, Shanann's memory. We here at Crime Talk have discussed that case quite a bit, but we have always, always tried to be respectful of all parties involved. I get comments of people, if I even refer to somebody as a gentleman, uh, it's not because I'm necessarily referring to them as a gentleman. I'm simply, um, that's, it's politeness. It's being kind. It's being um, just respectful of all parties. That's what you do in court. I think some people have this notion that in court you get to sit there and badmouth other people. Oh, no, you do not. Everyone is referred to by last names. Um, there's decency. One person talks. The other person gets to respond, and the judge decides. There's no going back and forth. There's no shouting at other every other person you know, the people in the courtroom, it's simply not that way. And that's why that is how we've tried to conduct this channel. And so, yes, the Watts case still has some relevance. There's lots of people out there that still want to talk about it, but we're going to talk about the facts and we're going to do it respectfully because that's what the facts are. Now, if there's an elephant in the room that needs to be talked about, we will talk about it. We're not going to gloss over it if it's going to necessarily hurt somebody's feelings, but we're going to talk about real facts, not speculation, not wacky conspiracy theories where we need to adjust our tinfoil hats. That's not going to happen here. We're going to talk about the facts, what they are, what they are not, but we don't make stuff up. Next case on the docket, is there a time to kill? I'm sure most people out there have seen that classic John Grisham novel that was turned into a movie, A Time to Kill. Um, where the uh, main character uh, shoots up uh, the and kills the uh, man who's accused of uh, sexually assaulting uh, his young daughter. And basically, he's found not guilty because the jury determined there was a time to kill. Well, there's a gentleman in the uh, state of Pennsylvania who has admitted to killing a teenage boy by shooting him five or six times because he believed that that 17-year-old got his daughter hooked on drugs, specifically cocaine. Michael DiBiagio, 41, is accused of murder for shooting this young kid five or six times for allegedly getting his daughter hooked on drugs. Apparently, he had driven to a pizza shop where he knew he would find the young man, shot him, and then shot him one more time to, quote, put him out of his misery. Now, ladies and gentlemen, A Time to Kill may be a good title for a book. There is a thing called jury nullification, which could potentially take place. But most people don't know about jury nullification. Okay, Jury nullification is where the jurors refuse to follow the law. An individual driving somewhere to shoot somebody five or six times, that is murder after deliberation. 
maybe some sort of heat of passion type of an exception uh, to reduce the punishment. Maybe somebody finds them guilty of a, a lesser uh, degree of murder. However, easily could be charged as first degree murder. A jury, if they assume that their oath is to follow the law and apply the facts to the law, would probably convict that person of murder. If they ignored that, that would be jury nullification. But jurors cannot be informed that they can do jury nullification. Attorneys cannot tell the jury that they could do jury nullification. And you certainly couldn't argue it in closing arguments at all. I completely understand why he would do something like that. I've known many a people that would love to have uh, killed the supplier or source of supply for their children who got addicted on drugs, but you can't do that. We can't take vigilantism uh, to the streets and kill and be the uh, uh, jury, judge, and executioner all at the same moment. That's not the way America was founded. We have a rule of law. But we do wish Mr. DiBiagio good luck on his trial. The United States, through the Attorney General last week, decided that they were going to reinstate the execution process. The previous administration had put a ban on uh, executions, and basically all these people that were lined up for um, execution are sitting in Terre Haute, Indiana, ready to go. So let's meet the five individuals that are first in line to uh, be executed, and you let me know if you think that they would deserve it. So please leave a comment below. The first one, Lesmond Mitchell, 37, killed a woman and her grandmother. Mr. Mitchell was convicted in 2003 of killing a grandmother and her nine-year-old granddaughter within the Navajo Nation in northeastern Arizona. The federal courts would have jurisdiction because crimes like that are governed by federal law. Uh, Mr. Mitchell and a friend were hitchhiking near the border with New Mexico when they were picked up by a 63-year-old grandmother. The two men stabbed her to death, then killed the granddaughter after forcing the child to sit near the grandmother's body while they drove 30 to 40 miles, according to the uh, Justice Department. They used the grandmother's truck in a robbery in New Mexico as well. Jury has uh, found them guilty, imposed the death penalty, and all of their appeals have been exhausted. The next person on the government's list is Wesley Perky, 67, killed a 16-year-old girl and an 80-year-old woman. This is an interesting case because the Kansas City Star reported last year that the girl's murder in 1998 was nearly forgotten until her childhood friends contacted a true crime podcast, which featured her in an episode. Federal prosecutors pursued the case because Miss Perky had brought the teenager across state lines from Missouri to Kansas. Mr. Perky was sentenced to death for the crime of kidnapping a child resulting in a child's death, according to court records. And it's alleged that Mr. Perky used a hammer to kill 80-year-old Ms. Bales, who suffered from polio. And he now has a new set of lawyers saying that he was inadequately represented and that he suffers from dementia. His execution is now currently set for December 13th. Daniel Lee, who is a white supremacist, lived in Oklahoma and was convicted in 1999 of murdering an Arkansas gun dealer, as well as his wife Nancy and their eight-year-old daughter. Mr. Lee had broken into the home of Mr. Tilly in January of 1996 with an accomplice, and together they suffocated the family before throwing them into the Illinois Bayou according to court records. The bodies were not found for several months when a woman discovered a shoe while fishing. The next individual in line for a federal execution is Alfred Bourgeois, 55, who tortured and killed his daughter. Mr. Bourgeois was sentenced to death in 2004 after he was convicted of murdering his two-year-old daughter at the Naval Air Station Corpus Christi, which made it a federal crime. He is scheduled for the death sentence on January 13 of 2020. Dustin Honkin, who is 51, was convicted of killing five individuals, including two children. His crimes go back to 1993 when he, along with the help of his girlfriend, who was once one of the only two women on federal death row. Mr. Honkin was a kingpin of a methamphetamine uh, drug operation, and the two men were his fellow drug dealers that he, that he killed along with his two acquaintances, girlfriends, and their children, ages 6 and 10. 
Mr. Honkin retaliated against these individuals because they had agreed to testify against him in court proceedings. His execution is set for January 15th of 2020. And the reason the feds picked this up is they brought him in under the uh, kingpin uh, statutes when it relates to drug dealing and murder. And the reason they pursued the death penalty was because Iowa does not have the death penalty. So those are the five individuals that the federal government plans to execute. Understand they've been convicted. Appeals have been exhausted. There will be last minute attempts to uh, bring about uh, stays from uh, federal courts, but it's unlikely that those will prevail, particularly in light of the uh, case law that we discussed in previous uh, episodes regarding uh, the death penalty, where the Supreme Court says you are entitled to a execution that's relatively painless, but not completely painless. Next up on the docket, Jennifer Dulos's mother, who has custody of her five children, wants Michelle Traconis to testify in a civil proceeding. As you all may recall, Ms. Traconis and Photos Dulos were charged in the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos, but the proceedings have all really kind of stopped. They have an upcoming proceeding uh, set for Friday, but still no murder charges. Unlike some jurisdictions, which we'll talk about soon, it's very difficult to prosecute a murder case without a body. Now, going to be very unlikely that Michelle Traconis will testify in any type of civil proceeding, particularly one to pay back a loan, because why? She has a Fifth Amendment right not to testify. She can assert that right, and then basically the deposition would be over. Now, I'm not going to say I know exactly what happens in New York, but in most jurisdictions, if one asserts their Fifth Amendment right, and in a civil proceeding, you can do that, but the judge will give it a jury instruction, letting people know that that's that they may consider that in the civil proceedings. You obviously do not get that in a criminal case because you have a right to remain silent, and that inference cannot be used against you in any way. Civil court, totally different matter. Next on the docket, we have the Patrick Frazee matter. And like we just talked about, some jurisdictions, most jurisdictions aren't going to charge a homicide case without a body. Well, here in Colorado, uh, down in Teller County, the district attorney, who's also the district attorney in El Paso County, which is Colorado Springs, has charged Patrick Frazee with the murder of Kelsey Lee Barrett, the mother of his child. She was a flight instructor. Uh, she was a mother of this young young child. Uh, that is now with her parents, and she's gone missing. It's alleged that Crystal Jean Kenny Lee, who is also a girlfriend of Mr. Patrick Frazee, who is also married but was engaged in some sort of relationship, she has pled guilty to basically um, accessory after the fact, which was uh, helping dispose of the body of Miss Barrett. Now, nothing has shown up. Um, we had some information a couple of weeks ago that a what they believed to be a human tooth uh, remain was found on one of the properties that they had searched and that that was going off for testing, but still nobody yet. And so the district attorney had a deadline of last Friday to decide whether they were going to file notice to go with the death penalty. No surprise here. Knew it wasn't going to happen. The district attorney down there is going to have a difficult case proving that Mr. Frazee killed Miss Barrett. And I'm not trying to say that. To, I'm not rooting for Mr. Frazee. Um, I'm not, I don't have sides. I'm trying to look at this as objectively as possible. But from someone who's prosecuted cases and someone who's defended many, many cases, this is a defense attorney's dream. You have a woman, Miss Lee, who says that she was going to go kill Miss Barrett on several occasions, but that she basically stopped and panicked and then supposedly Patrick Frazee comes in and finishes the job, but orders her to drive from Idaho to come clean up the crime scene. Doesn't make any sense. What's the quickest way to get somebody else in trouble? Simply tell the facts of what happened and change the names of the players that were there. Happens all the time. That's, I believe, is going to be the defense that the Frazee defense team will make in this particular case. So we'll be watching that trial starting soon. And finally on the docket... We have a case out of Arizona. There's a teacher down there by the name of Brittany Zamora. She's 28, and she pled guilty to multiple sex abuse charges because she was a teacher, and she thought that it would be appropriate to have sexual relations with her 13-year-old student, male student. Not that that matters. That's still against the law. Wrong, big time. 
So Ms. Zamora received a 20-year sentence from the judge. And it probably didn't help that her attorney made the argument that it really wasn't her fault that the other kid had kind of asked for it. Big, huge, huge mistake. Anytime somebody goes to sentencing and you're in front of that judge, you have to remember, you have pled guilty. Now, some people say, but I pled guilty to avoid a greater consequence, and I'm really not guilty. Guess what? When you plead guilty, you admit as a matter of law and as a matter of fact that that's what happened, unless you specifically are doing what they call an Alford plea, where you're saying, I'm not saying I did, I'm not saying I didn't, but I'll accept the responsibility. Most cases, judges aren't going to accept that, particularly on a felony matter. So when you go in front of the sentencing, you apologize. You say, I accept my responsibility. You don't throw it back on the victim. And that's what happened, and that's why I think she got a 20-year sentence. Moral of that story? Don't have sex with minors, first of all. If you're a teacher in a position of trust, don't have sex with your students, ladies and gentlemen. Bad. Nothing good is going to come from it. You will have nothing but regret, and you'll probably go to prison for a very long time. That's it for Crime Talk. Let us know in the comments if you think those five contestants uh, from the United States government uh, deserve the death penalty, and do you think that... uh, Miss Zamora deserves a 20-year sentence. Leave a comment below. Let's talk about it.